just in way of review from last week, we came to, I guess, the most difficult passages that we have to swallow. And that was in Romans 3.10 where he says there is none righteous, not even one. None of us understand. None of us seek after God. I told you that was Paul's conclusion, but we also understand that that's God's conclusion. That's what God wants to communicate to us as this condition, our spiritual condition. It is absolutely of one that is of unrighteousness. And so while all of those passages leave us with our mouths closed, and I'll show you that later on this morning, the passages that we turn to, namely beginning in verse 21 where he says, but now those passages should cause our mouths to fly open in praise to God. There's been a great many men that have been converted just from the passages that we'll begin to cover this morning. I guess the most significant of those men to ever be converted, not to diminish any of the rest, but the conversion of Martin Luther took place when he read through these passages and God began to explain these passages to his heart. And it was through his understanding of Romans 3.21 and following that God used his efforts to rescue the gospel from the clutches of the Roman Catholic Church because they had changed the gospel. It was no longer faith alone in Christ alone. It was faith plus works. And so these are the passages that God used to rescue again or begin the reformation that's been going on for over 500 years. And the reality is we're still reforming because men still want to change the gospel. And so these are the passages that we come to to understand the gospel in its clearest sense. One commentator described it in this way, Leon Morris, if you know who I'm, who I'm talking about, he said this is possibly the most important single paragraph ever written. Of course, I would edit that and say this is definitely the most single important paragraph that's ever been penned. I mean, all of the Word of God is, well, we just don't have the words to adequately describe His Word, right? But in these verses, we stand atop the mountain. That is the Word of God. And for no other reason than the reason that I just mentioned, it is because that we understand the gospel more clearly here than any other place that I know. These are glorious passages. And I've wrestled with my own ability. I'm as equipped to preach these passages as I am to go on the next mission to the moon. It just can't be done in a way that's fitting. And I hope to hear our Lord preach these someday. These are tremendous words. Words that should really cause us to erupt in praise to God. Now, I want to walk through these passages by presenting a question to you this morning. And hopefully by the end of it, we can all clearly see the answer. But here's the question. If God is righteous in all that He is and all that He does, and certainly He is, then how is it that He can be righteous and yet let the guilty go free? How in the world can God always do right and then turn around and let the guilty go free? Because we all know that's not right. John Stott worded the question in this way, and he obviously does a much better job than me. How can God be just if he justifies the unjust? How can God be just if he justifies the unjust? And so that's what I want us to consider this morning. Now, I panicked this week. Because to understand these passages, you've got to understand the righteousness of God. And when I began to, un to realize that, you know, we've got to understand this word, I panicked because I thought, well, what I communicated back in Romans 1, 16 and 17, I don't like anymore. So I was like, we've got to start Romans over again. But then I realized, and I know you'll be thanking God for this as well, Someone reminded me that as Westerners or as Americans, we always think either or. It's A or it's B, it's one or it's two, it's either or it's or, it's not both. But in the Bible, it was written from a Hebrew context, and they're not either or people, they're both and people. And that's very hard for us to think in those perspectives. But when you begin to think about the righteousness that we see communicated in Romans, especially in 321, there's a lot going on here, but all of it's based around the righteousness of God. So I want to give you six thoughts if you're taking notes. 
about the different perspectives that you and I will see in regard to righteousness. And the first perspective is it is always of God. It belongs to Him. Now, we say that, and we've got to be careful here, just like God is holy, 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 equally we could say God is righteous, righteous, righteous. He doesn't just possess righteousness like something. He is righteous from beginning to end. Does that make sense? The essence of His nature is righteousness. All right? So that's one form of righteousness that we have to understand. The second one is this. Righteousness is the basis for everything God does. Everything that He does is right. When God judges sin and condemns the sinner, the only thing that you and I can say is, He is righteous. Because the guilty deserve punishment. That's what God does and He's righteous when He does that. But then in the same respect, God is righteous when He saves His people because God has said that He would deliver His people. And so when God fulfills His promise, you and I raise our hands and we go, God is righteous. So whether He's judging or saving, everything He does, it's based upon who He is, His righteousness. Now thirdly, this is the one that makes us very nervous. Righteousness is required for entry into heaven. You have to be righteous. And that's a terrible place to be and it's a terrible word to hear because we just walked from 118 all the way to 320 leaving you with the understanding, if anything else, you're unrighteous. You're terribly unrighteous in every respect. Remember the passage, there is none righteous and yet God requires righteousness of you to enter into heaven. But then here's the beautiful thing, what God requires, God provides. And so God achieves righteousness. And that's something we'll see very clearly in these passages this morning. God requires it and God accomplishes it. Which leaves only one other thing for God to do. And He imputes that righteousness to us. He achieves it. He accomplishes it. And then through His grace, He gives it to us. So there's five and I told you there's six. And of course the sixth one should make sense and it is this. Righteousness is proclaimed by God in the gospel. That's what we said back in 118. For the gospel is the righteousness of God. It's His righteousness that has been demonstrated and it's His righteousness that has been achieved. It's His righteousness that's been given and His righteousness has been declared. I put it like this if you're... Uh, what is that? Few words, say more or whatever that is. Uh, God is righteous. He acts based upon it. He requires it. He accomplishes it. He imputes it. He proclaims it. And so as we walk through these passages, you need to understand, I may refer to righteousness, but there's a whole lot going on here that I can't just stop and explain each time. It's, it's an overwhelming reality of God. But again, in the face of all this righteousness, we come to 321 with the sober reality that we are terribly unrighteous. But do you realize you wouldn't even know that had it not been for the grace of God when He gave us the law? Don't you absolutely despise it when somebody who is normally kind to you turns a cold shoulder to you. Now they're avoiding you. They won't even speak to you. And for the life of you, you can't figure out what you did. And the only thing that you would really love for them to do is just tell you. It's not as though you couldn't handle the bad news. I mean, just tell me so at least that we can deal with this thing. Don't just stop calling. Don't just stop texting. Don't just turn away. Tell me what I did that so offended you. It would be wonderful if Christians would begin that trend, right? But you do understand God has done that very thing for us when He gave us this law. You're unrighteous. Let me show you how. Let me show you how you have rebelled against me. And let me show you the punishment that you will receive for the rebellion that you have done against me. You see, God was very clear to us when He told us, we're unrighteous and you will suffer my wrath because these are the things that you have done. Now we said when we walked through 118, for us, the Gentiles, He wrote the law on our hearts and we have broken that law and we understand that we are under the righteous judgment of God. 
hopefully we'll come to the conclusion this morning, or if you didn't last week, you will this morning. If God condemns us, the only thing that we can say in response to that is, you're righteous. You have done what is right. But for the Jews, he did one thing further, right? For the Jews, he actually wrote it down on tablets or a piece of paper, if you will, and they took what was written down, what was definitely clear. They didn't have to wonder about their own hearts. They... Divorce, let me stop and give you an example of this. We all know that that's wrong. And yet sometimes people come to me and say, God has told me that's okay. And I'm like, He did no such thing. He never has, He never will. It's wrong from beginning to end. But you see, for the Jew, that was written down on a piece of paper. They don't have to walk around going, Well, I feel in my heart that God says adultery is okay. No, it's written down. You don't have to wonder in your heart. It's written down for you. And the Jews took what was written down for them. They rebelled against it. And of course, when God judges them, He is righteous. So we understand how unrighteous and how sinful we are because of the grace of God. We wouldn't have known if He had not done what He did. And so the very purpose of the law has been accomplished Because God says this in Romans 3.20, Because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. You want to know the primary purpose of the law? There you go. God says, I wanted to teach you that you are sinners. That you're absolutely sinful. But again, what the Jews did was absolutely contrary to what God was doing with the law. Rather than understanding their own sinfulness, they took it as a means to establish their goodness. You're like, you you totally missed the point in what we were trying or what God was trying to do. And that's why Paul tells them here and also in verse 320, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. They sought to achieve righteousness but it was given for the very purpose of proving their unrighteousness. In other words, the law ruined every effort for us to justify ourselves. It was simply not possible. They grossly misused the law. It's like, I was trying to, I had this metaphor jotted down, I I drew the line through it, scratched it out, but I'll pick it back up again. It's like buying somebody a life jacket. You know they got a new boat, and you know they're going to the river this summer. So, you, you know, you do the nice thing and you get them a really nice life jacket. Right. And then you see them in town one Friday night out at a nice place to eat. and They're wearing that life jacket. And you're like, what in the world are you doing with your life jacket on? Oh, it's nice. You know, kind of keeps me warm. I like the color. Matches my outfit. Goes with my shoes. So I just wanted to wear it. And you think, how bizarre. Whatever. And then the summer, a few weeks later, you see them out in the river and they're just running around in a T-shirt and shorts. You pull up alongside them in the boat and you say, where's your life jacket? Oh, that thing's hot. I don't really want to wear it. You know, it's just bulky and makes me sweat. I just like t-shirt and shorts. And you think, you know what you think. I won't say it. But you're like, you just don't get this, do you? You don't understand the purpose and the gift that I have given you. You've totally misused this thing. It's not to make you look better. It's to save your soul in case you fall out of this boat. And they're like, oh, I didn't even think. Does it float? Yeah, man, it floats, okay? That's what the Jews do with the law. It was never designed to make you look better. It was meant to save you, not that it had salvation within itself. I'll show you that in just a second. But it was to help them understand that they did need saving. But they used it to justify themselves. But if you think about it, through this grace that God has given us, the man who considers his own sinfulness wisely and thoughtfully as revealed to him in the law, should in fact see the problem that there's something wrong with his heart. And when he understands that, you do understand that the law has accomplished its task. Notice this in verse 19, where Paul says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are literally in the law, not necessarily under the law, in the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Not only does the law reveal your sin, the law also helps understand your guilt, and it's supposed to close your mouth. Now, I really got a good picture of this when 
we went up to the Northwest because that was during the time of my life that I was working with drug addicts. And if you've ever have one, you know, we all do in our families and all this business and friends, they never shut up. That was something I could never get over. I'm just like, will you please close your mouth for two seconds? Everything you say, every principle you bring up, every passage you show them, it's just like it turns their mouth on. And you're just wanting to say, be quiet for two seconds and listen to me. And in fact, I began to understand until I find their mouth closed, I'm actually not getting anything done. Because the purpose of the law is for you to realize, I'm dead in the water. I've got no excuse. I've got no fingers to point. I've got no one to, to blame. It's me and me alone, and I am guilty before God. And let me tell you where you'll see this. You tell your kids time and time again, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, right? And then you go in their room one day, you open, your, open their door, and there they stand doing the thing. And hopefully, they understand what you've told them enough that they'll simply drop their head and tears will begin to roll down their cheeks. Now, I know what you're going to do. You're going to be mad because they're doing it, but you need to pause and praise God because the law had its effect. It actually closed the mouth of your child. And that's what you want it to do because they realize I'm dead to rights. I've got nothing to say. I've got no excuse to offer. I mean, I've even had one of my kids go, well, I guess you have to whip me. You're right. I do. It's the law in my house, right? That's what you want it to accomplish. So praise God for it. If the law does its job, it's supposed to close our mouths. And we're supposed to understand, I deserve punishment. Now, let me show you something that's absolutely wonderful. Keep your finger there, but I also had you turn to Luke 23. So back up with me to Luke 23, and I want to show you something that uh, it's just too good to miss, really. And I'm, I'm sure, hopefully, I pointed it out. Maybe I did when we walked through the Gospel of Luke. But Luke chapter 23, and I want to start in verse 39. Luke 23, verse 39. You know, there were two thieves hanging on the cross that day, right? One of the thieves, or the criminals who were hanged there, was hurling abuse at Jesus, saying, Are you not the Christ? Why don't you save yourself and us? But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? Verse 41. We indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. You see, we always make so much of verse 42 when he looks at Jesus and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And yeah, you should make much of that, but you should also make much of verse 41, where he comes to the understanding that I am justly deserving this condemnation. You'd be surprised. It is the work of the Spirit of God for a man to come to that conclusion. I mean, get the picture as you're walking back to Romans 3. The guy's hanging on the cross and he's about to die. A horrible death. And he's not screaming out. He's not blaming. He's not cursing. He's not justifying himself. He's not crying, why me, why me, why me? He simply says this statement, I'm getting what I deserve. I understood the law. I broke the law. And here I hang. And it is absolutely just. And again, I'll say to you, until you come to that place in your life, you have yet to understand the gospel. Because when you want to talk about the sins of people, what do they want to do? They want to either justify themselves or they want to talk about somebody who's worse than themselves. We all do that. Oh, you want to talk about how bad I am? Well, let me tell you about Cody is. What about when he did this the other day? We deflect. Get it off of me. Get it onto somebody else. But you know, it's really hard to get it off of you when you're hanging up there like he was on a cross. It's really hard to divert the attention. And he understood by the grace of God, I'm getting what I deserve. And brothers and sisters, I pray that when you've come to the end of what we just walked through last week, you would be able to glorify God for your condemnation 
really, because God is just. And He is doing what we deserve. Now, as we go back to Romans 3, we all understand our desperate lack of righteousness in our desperate need for God. And I think that man on Luke 23 understood his desperate need for God because he simply looked at him and said, remember me. Because that is literally the only hope that we have. We have to appeal to the mercy of God. But then we're reminded that God himself is merciful. Now, when you turn to 321, you have a but. And it's glorious. It's exactly what we need. In fact, it's just in time that we see these words, but now apart from the law. Let me talk about that first phrase, apart from the law, because the law that condemned me was never given to me in order to save me, but only to help me understand that I was in desperate need of salvation. God never made any provision in the law for salvation, eternal salvation, because he told us back in verse 20, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. So it's a glorious thing to be moved away from that which condemns us. It's a glorious thing to escape that cross the thief was hanging on. It's a glorious thing to escape that judgment as your child is standing before you, as their shoulders begin to shake and the tears roll down their face, to understand that, hey, my parent or God has done something apart from that which condemns me. I'm sure your children rejoice when you didn't bring the belt because you're going to do something apart from the law. You're going to extend grace, and I encourage you to do both from time to time. They do need to understand the law, which comes with a belt, and they do need to understand the grace at times when you don't come with the belt. But we need to see that what God has done that is so glorious, He's done something that was apart from the law. And it's something yet that the law gives testimony to. Again, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. You see, at the same time, God used the law as a witness to our need for a righteousness that was not our own. There are so many promises in the Old Testament. There's so many pictures and types of God delivering His people. Listen, based on His character, not theirs. Let me say that again because we came to that reality Wednesday night and we stayed there for a while. God saves us based on who He is, not who we are. And that's a glorious thing. And He gave testimony to that in the law because the people deserved death for their sin and for their rebellion. Yet God, apart from the law, giving testimony through the law, He did something on our behalf, right? So the law gives testimony to our unrighteousness, but it also gives testimony to the effect, to the effect or to the fact, rather, that God would achieve righteousness on our behalf. Now, where is this found? Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed or made known. It was witnessed to us by the law and the prophets. And it is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I haven't used the word yet, I don't think, but let me use it right now. We need an, a righteousness that is alien to us. It's not of us. Remember, we are not righteous. We do not possess righteousness. We do not have righteousness. We cannot achieve righteousness. And so God does something absolutely contrary to who we are, something He gives us that we do not possess, we cannot produce, and it is an alien righteousness given to us, and it comes to us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It comes to us in union with a relationship with a person. And so we have Jesus, the only man to ever be considered by God as perfectly righteous, even righteous from the heart, because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, met the re righteous requirements of God. He's the only one. Remember last week in verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not even one. And so God Himself came, because God is righteous. We started out with that. 
Righteousness is a quality that only God possesses. We needed it, so He came Himself. He sent His Son, the only one to ever meet the righteous requirements of God. And so how do we come into this righteousness? Through faith. Our only hope for righteousness is to receive that alien gift from God. And certainly we do so through faith. But I need, I need to pause again because, and I think I do this every time we talk about faith. I almost named all of my efforts in Romans because I, you know, I got to give this book a title that I'm creating here for my kids, but I almost named it Faith. I was going back and forth between is Romans all about the gospel or is Romans all about faith? And I really struggled with that quite some time and I'm thankful that I landed on the gospel because by the time I've made it to chapter 3, I realize faith is glorious, but don't do too much with it. And this is what I mean by this. Faith is simply a conduit. It's just a means. It's just the way that God has provided to attain righteousness because righteousness is in a person. So often we want to make faith the object. God's not going to look at you and go, okay, I see faith, therefore I reward righteousness. That's not how that works. He looks at you and says, I see you in union with my son. I see Jesus. You're rewarded with righteousness. Faith is simply the means of obtaining that. And my fear is the majority of people, especially in Southern Baptist churches that have misunderstood the gospel and have not been converted, have been caught up in this particular problem because they made faith the object. It is as if we have taken ten commandments and go, I can't ever do that. Well, can you do one? I know you can't do ten, but can you do one? And I'll even tell you how to demonstrate the one. And so every denomination you go to, well, you demonstrate faith by whatever. And they'll give you something to do. Walk an aisle, and we go through this list all the time. Recite a prayer, and you get up and you go, now you have faith. Well, I'm sorry, faith is not what you need. You need Jesus. Faith is just the means through which you obtain that. And what's the word that I always use for faith? There is a better word than faith. It's the word trust, because we don't, we understand how important trust is, but Trust is not the issue. Like we all trust our spouses with our hearts, right? But the object is not the trust. The object is the person. Because I trust my wife. Therefore, I sleep at night. But if something goes sideways with her, are you going to criticize my trust? You'll be like, well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> the problem's not with your trust. Dude, the problem's with her. And I'll be like, that's exactly right. Why do we do that with Jesus? Well, I've got trust. I've got trust. Let me tell you how to manifest trust. Repeat after me. God's not looking for that. God's looking for His Son. Trust is just how you come into relationship with His Son. Jesus is the object. Faith is simply the means, right? Now, next, let me move on. I'm sorry, I lost my thought there. Here's the beautiful thing about this righteousness that we receive. It is to all without any distinction whatsoever. It is there for everyone, this righteousness of God. And I gave this some thought. I hope it's not confusing for you. It's worked out in my heart. I don't know if it's worked out in my mouth yet. But listen, in the, in the wisdom of God... He has left us all in sin, every single man. Which means that the need of every single man is to look away from himself. And so the only means for salvation is for every man to look to the one man that God has provided, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I realized that and I thought that is absolutely brilliant. God has assigned us all over to sin in order that He might have mercy on some and it's to some without any sort of distinction because the only requirement is for you to look to one man, the Son. That's why Paul could go anywhere in the known world during that day and preach the same gospel because there was only one place to look for salvation. And that's why we can go to Thailand or we can go to 
Myanmar or we can go to China or we can go to Russia or we can go wherever and we're preaching the same gospel because all men have the same problem because God has taken all men, Romans 1, 18 and following, and put them all in the same boat and they're all under the wrath of God and now that I've got you all in the same place, let me give you the one place that all of you need to look. It's brilliant. And it gives the opportunity for every man to come to faith in Christ because of what God has done. So it literally, it literally does not have any regard for your race or for your heritage or your particular sin because it does not change the one way that you're made right with God. Nothing matters about your past. Nothing matters about the religion that you followed before you came. Nothing matters because it does not change the source of your salvation, and that is the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why God can say this through the Apostle Paul, we are justified as a gift by His grace. It's absolutely amazing. And, and justified here, we've talked about this word, it's simply a declaration of release. I use the term, I think, when we started Romans as the forensic term. It's a legal term. It's a term that can be used as a court of law that simply states not guilty. Not guilty. It, it doesn't just remove from us the wrath of God. There's no longer any reason for the wrath of God. Do you understand that? Rebellion is met with wrath. And because we're justified, declared innocent, there's no more rebellion. There's no need for wrath. And that's why Paul comes to the conclusion in Romans 8, 1, and we'll eventually get there. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation is off the table for you if you're in Christ. And the only reason for that is the character of God, not your character. The only reason that is is because of the grace of God and the mercy of God. He says, justified. Man. Are you kidding me? Yes. That is awesome. We are justified through what the Son has done on our behalf. We are legally declared innocent. And condemnation is removed. And we're not faced with judgment by the free grace of God. Yes, that's the right place, Danny. Amen. Let that get a hold of your heart. Yeah, I just want to take you to Romans 12 right now. I did Wednesday night, but I want one. I won't now, but offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Give your whole life to God. Why? Because He's justified you by His grace. And He did it based on His character. You've been set free. Now what follows in, in the passage for the rest of this is still wonderful things. And I want us to keep going and look at that. Jesus accomplished all that through two words. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. Now I'll go into this in a lot more detail on Wednesday night. Uh, but briefly here, redemption is slave market language. And we touched on this some this past week. And here's the picture. We are enslaved to sin. We're enslaved to death. And God has delivered us by paying a ransom price for us. We were slaves. We could not get free. Our captor was cruel. Our judgment was more than we could bear. Death was looming. We were swallowed up in sin and God came along and bought us. He purchased us and we were set free. We have a new owner and he is a gracious God. This word's used in passages I know you're familiar with. Mark 10, 45, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, a ransom for many. This is what the son has done for us. 1 Timothy 2, there is one God, one mediator between God and man. That man is Jesus Christ who gave himself as a ransom for all. A ransom. Christ 
paid our price and we were set free. But more than that, God displayed him publicly as a propitiation. Another good word for that is atonement. And this word is a little more difficult for us. But to suffice it to say, there was a sacrifice in your place. And this sacrifice, listen, didn't just remove your sin or provide forgiveness, right? It averted the wrath of God against you. The judgment of God that was required to be poured out on you justly was instead poured out on the one who went before you. Now here's, let me say this statement, and then people have a great problem with this, and this is why they have a great problem with Christianity. Many people profess to have faith in Christ, yet deny this reality. This sacrifice that Jesus presented to God was necessary to appease God. You thought about that? People don't like that. They don't like worshiping a God that needs to be appeased from His wrath. But it literally averted the wrath of God from you. Now, it required blood. And here's why it required blood. And I'm not simply saying blood dripping on the ground. I'm meaning the lifeblood was poured out of Jesus Christ. And if I had a chalkboard, I would do it in math because there's a constant, right? All sin is met with God's wrath Because God is just. If there is sin, it is met with an overwhelming flood of the wrath of God because God is perfect and just and all sin deserves death. That's the constant. You can't change that. And so rather than being unjust and changing His law, God keeps His law in absolute unblemished perfection and Christ stands in your place. And as God's wrath comes, it turns away from you and it falls on the Son. That's propitiation. You weren't just forgiven like we do our kids. We walk in a room and we go, ah, you know, grace. I'm going to hang the belt back up on the loop. You know you did was wrong. Tears are rolling down your eyes. There'll be no punishment today, grace. But that's not propitiation. You ought to do that every now and then, but that's not propitiation. If you want to demonstrate propitiation, hand them the belt. And you say, you wear me out. You beat me for what you've done that's wrong. And when your child gets done, you turn to them and say, that's what Christ has done for us. He was the sacrifice. He's the one that became sin. And God's wrath was immovable. It was coming. Because God does what is right and just, and all sin deserves death. He didn't toss it up under the rug. He didn't tossle your hair. The wrath came. And before it got to your soul, God turned it away and it came on His Son. That's a beautiful thing. How God saved you should leave us all with mouths open offering praise and thanksgiving to a God who is just as well as the justifier of the one who has faith or trust in Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'll stop there. There's more here, and I'll go on either tonight or, or, or next Sunday. But I want to leave you with that thought. In fact, I want to leave you with that analogy about your kids. I wouldn't be surprised if some of you tried it sometime. Just so they'll understand the gospel. You did wrong, and there's punishment for that. But as your dad, I'm going to take that for you. Because that's what God has done for me. He didn't forget it. He didn't sweep it away. He didn't turn the other cheek or turn a blind eye, so to speak. He didn't do that because He's perfect. And the wrath of God came. And the sun swallowed it whole on Calvary. I will turn you to the last words of this passage. If you'll look back in verse 21, you've got the but now. And whether it's tonight or, or next Sunday, I'll show you all this is presented in a perfect tense, meaning God says, I've done it. 
I've done it. It's finished. When my son died on that tree, it was finished. And for all of you who put your faith alone in Christ alone, you're justified. It is done. But for those of you who are not, you're still left face to face with the reality of but now. For the saint, but now there's nothing left but rejoicing and praising God. There's nothing left but praise and worship for all eternity. But now, worship. But for the sinner, you're still staring at that because you've yet to come to terms with that. And as Paul would say, I implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Understand that you're guilty before the Lord. I hope you understand it to the point where your mouth is closed before God and, and you understand, God, if you condemn me as they carry me off, I will turn to you and worship you because you have done what is right. I rebelled and I deserve and you have done and I praise you as they carry me out from your presence. But if you're there, praise God for that understanding. But at the same time, Appeal to Him based on His mercy. Appeal to Him based on the kindness of His love because He is a merciful God who is willing to forgive. He's a God that is willing to take punishment away from you and to exercise it on His own Son. That is a God who will forgive sin. And so if you finally come to the place in your life where you're not offering excuses anymore, you understand, then cry out to God for the mercy, His mercy to save. And I would encourage you to do that until He saves you. And like I tell kids, you'll know it. You'll know when the Spirit of God enters your soul and converts your heart. Because you know what you'll do at that point? You'll do what the rest of us are doing. We're praising God. Because, but now we know what he has done on our behalf. Let's pray.